Welcome to Gravel Ridge Young Baptist Church. This is our recorded service for April 26. We are still all under quarantine, but luckily we are able to record services for you guys, and it's truly an honor to be able to get up here and do this for you. Um, we are following the CDC's recommendations, and next week they might make some announcements as far as uh, lessening restrictions or whatever. We will keep everybody uh, monitored we'll we'll let you know what's going on with that uh there'll be something posted probably in the group me i don't i don't know who how when we'll be opening if it'll be soon or if it's going to be later but it's all to be determined um but we are going to be exercise extreme caution whatever we do so uh thank you everybody for for your patience and understanding so um before we get started i'd like to go over a few uh prayer requests I think um, Tampa's daughter-in-law's dad is battling cancer, and if I remember right, he might have had a heart attack. Uh, he's in the um, hospital, intensive care, I think, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure, but I just know that he, he needs our prayer, and her family needs our prayer. And, and uh, Shelly and Amber Stores opened back up, so... That's good news, one, and then hopefully they can start making it where when we do open back up, they can, they can start attending church here with us on Sunday. But we pray for them, them too, Amber and, and Shelly, that they, uh, you know, their things go well opening their store and, and, and them being around the constant public and different public and everything, that, that the, they have a hedge of protection over them. So um, we also need to keep all of our uh, frontline workers and medical workers the um any essential employees you know that and believe it or not that includes construction workers i mean who would figure but you know there's a lot of them that are out still still working you know there's also i mean on top of the medical people first responders you know police any of those people that have to be out and dealing with the public um you know there's just some people we have we have to make a living you know that's what we that's how we make a living we don't get to work from home and so we, we do what we got to do to provide for our family. So um, most everybody does it without complaining, and I take my hat off to them. So uh, let's just keep a keep a uh, some prayer out for all them people for a hedge of protection over them, and and to just for everybody to use common sense. You know, wash your hands, wear your mask. You know, it might not look cool, but it's okay. So. Um, before we get started with our message today, I would just like to open us up in a word of prayer real quick. Lord, Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us, Lord. Lord, I just pray that your message comes out, Lord, Father, that, that I don't get in the way, Lord. I know I'll get in the way if, if it's up to me, Lord, Father. I just pray that your message comes out. I seek no glory from this, but that only to glorify you. Lord, Father, I pray that this message reaching somebody today, that they, they speak to their heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us here, and I thank you for the building, and I thank you for the meeting, and I thank you for the equipment we have here. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being our Lord and Savior. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so we've all been under quarantine, I think, whatever you want to call it, the uh, quarantine, this virus, it seems like it's been going on for about six weeks now, I think, if not a month, you know, and it's been going on long enough that we can all we're all starting to learn some stuff, I and mean, we've all learned something different, you know. Uh, I myself have learned that there's a few things I have made idols, you know, because I, I, they're not there right now, and I don't really, I didn't realize how much I had made them a little bit too important. Sometimes you learn, I've learned that there's certain things that I didn't give enough attention to that now that you don't have it or you can't do it, it's kind of like, Man, I, I, that was, you know, I need to give that more attention when I give it, you know, when I have the time to. Um, we've just learned that, hey, there's certain ways we can do things that we've never done it before. There's a lot more digital stuff, uh, computer stuff going on that people can, can do now that they didn't before. And, and luckily, I don't have to work with computers because I'd be in trouble. But, um, you know, the, the world's going to be different once this all settles. That I can guarantee that the, the world will change somehow. I don't know how it will be. I can't tell you. I'm not a forecaster of the future, but 
it will change. We will, it, this has been drastic enough of things that the world will change somehow, some way. Um, but I know one thing that I have noticed that, that, that has been the same before this um, pandemic and even during this pandemic is that there's just some people that, that, that'll carry a grudge and they just can't let things go, you know, and they let it control them. You know, they might have a grudge against somebody for something that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, and if you really think about it, was it that big a deal? No, but some people just can't let things go, you know, but they, 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 get, uh, they get their feelings hurt real easy. You know, that, that is easy to do. And sometimes we hurt, might hurt somebody's feelings and we don't mean to. Or maybe our feelings get hurt and we don't know how to respond or how to handle that. Maybe we just get what you could sum it up to as being offended. Somebody offended us. You know, we're having to be able to learn to handle being offended. Um, so one thing I do know is that any life question you got, there's an answer in the Bible for it. The more I've learned, the more I've studied, the more I study more, there is, a, there is an answer for anything in the Bible. So let's look in uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 1 through 4. Luke chapter 17, verse 1 through 4. Now while y'all are looking for the scripture, I'd like to bring one thing to attention. I know I reference a lot of scriptures sometime and sometimes and and I might reference them and read them and I'm not expecting everybody to just flip back and forth to their Bible if they want to. Hey, that's great. But our main this will be our main verse or verses of scripture that we're going to study on today. So uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 1 through 4 it says, "Then he said to the disciples, it is important possible that no offense should come but woe to him through whom they do come it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you rebuke him and if he repents forgive him and if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So the title of our message today is going to be Handling Offenses. In this passage right here, Jesus warns of offenses. So there isn't, like I said, an answer for everything. So that's what we're going to study on today is how to handle offenses, offenses, whether you have offended somebody or whether somebody has offended you. So... Let's, first, let's look at the first, very first verse here. Then he said to, his, to the disciples, it is impossible that no offense should come. So the first thing he says is, it is impossible that no offense should come. So he, what he is telling you is that it is going to happen. It is impossible that it will not happen. It is going to happen. Another way you could say this is it is not possible and capable that a person is not going to get offended. At some point in time in your life, you're going to get offended. More like probably at some point during the day you will get offended. Either it will happen to you or you will cause it to happen. So impossible is incapable of being or incurring. Now let's look at let's look at the uh, definition of offense. So that could be something that uh, rages the moral or physical senses of somebody. Uh, the state of being insulted. It could be a, 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 it can be an offensive team. You know, football, soccer. You got the offense. You got the defense. We're not talking about that. It could be a breach of a moral or social code. A sin to def to offend. I'm sorry. You could cause dislike or anger to cause sin or fail fall. So what we're going to talk about is to um, 
talk about somebody causing somebody to sin, somebody to cause them to offend them. Let's kind of look at a brief description of Paul, what Paul has here. So in Romans 14, 21, it says, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So by which your brother stumbles. So we don't want to cause them to sin. So if they're walking and they stumble, if you trip them, you cause them to fall. So think of something like, like you mislead somebody. So did the devil not mislead Eve about eating the fruit, the forbidden fruit? He said, surely this won't hurt. Surely God doesn't mind. So the devil led her to sin. The devil was the direct cause of it. He caused her to trip up. So now another part of the scripture says, or by which your brother is offended to offend. I cannot believe that they said that. A person is getting offended by what somebody said to them. You know, there's, there's two guys that I know, and, and these guys, are either they either love each other or they're madder than all get out of each other. I'll, I'll see them out while I'm at work, and, and one of them will be like, man, one day they're just, loving life and everything else, and, and 10 minutes later, they're both of them sold up, you know. What's wrong? You know what he said to me? What? You know, and then the next day, they're back being bus buddies, but somebody, one person has said something to the other one, and it offended them, you know. It's crazy. Now, um, the other example here is, Well, let me back up. So let's look at Proverbs. Proverbs 18, 19. It says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like bars of a castle. So kind of like these two guys I was talking about, they get offended. Well, they just, you could offer them a $100 bill. I ain't taking your money. You know, you could say, hey, you know, man, look, dude, I, I, I'm done with you. Some people like that. You, get, you offend them by what you said, I mean, it's, you can hang it up. So, there's one time I had, um, when I was like 18 years old, and I, I had, I had the world figured out. You know, you're 18, you, you think you know everything. And I was going to college. I was, I was enrolled for a semester. I think I went like three weeks, but I was supposed to start off working a, a part-time job at this uh, heavy equipment dealership. And, Anyways, I did odd and end stuff, you know, and then it kind of led into, they started letting me work during the day, and then, and then they moved me over into the parts department, and I'd always started at 7.30 before was with the other crew I worked on, and well, I didn't realize they started at 7, so I got there a little before 7, and I would sit there with the, the old guys that didn't start till 7.30, the mechanics, and drink coffee and BS and everything till 7.30, in the morning and uh, then I would go and start back there in the warehouse you know and it just made the guy my boss madder than all get out but he never told me he never was like dude you're you're uh you're supposed to start at 7 30 in the morning you know but um anyways I had offended him and I didn't realize it so you got to let somebody know when you offend them is the moral of that story here so Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift or by which your brother is made weak. So, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take somebody with a, um, let me back up here. So we got another example of this scripture from um, Paul here. And it was, let me get my stuff here together. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do, any, do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. 
So if they are made weak, you put them in a situation that makes them weak. So if somebody's got a gambling problem, you wouldn't take them to uh, Oakland to watch the horses race. You know, I like going and watching the horses. I hadn't been in a long time, but it's kind of exciting watching them race. You know, but you went, hey, man, let's go watch the horses race. And if you knew that person had a gambling problem, that probably wouldn't be a good idea, you know. Somebody was an alcoholic, you wouldn't say, hey, man, why don't you all come over to the, we're getting together for drinks, you know, why don't you come? You can have some water or something, you know. I know you got a drinking problem, but you can have some water. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't go well. You're putting them right in front of the, the deal, you know. That that's, would not happen well. So you got to make sure you put, um, you cannot put them in a position to, to sin or to lead to sin. So our definition of offenses is going to be to cause someone to sin or to lead them to sin or cause them to be weak towards temptation. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So let's go back to Luke 17, 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offense should come. We, we've established that, what we're talking about here. But woe to him through whom they do come. Woe to him. So what is woe? You know, I think of woe like, woe, Nelly, woe, horses. Woe to him would be, woe is like great sorrow or distress. Woe to him would be like he would be inflicting great sorrow or distress on himself. So, woe to him, but woe to him through the, whom, they, whom they do come. Well, let's move on to Luke 17, too. It would be better, so we're going to look at why it's not good for him to do this. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So what is a millstone? A millstone is a, like a great big stone you see on the, like, the old time deals, you know, the, the ancient times where they're like rolling around on a concrete thing and that's how they, they would grind the corn or grain or whatever. They would make it into meal and they would roll that stone over it. Big old heavy stone. So um, right here it says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of those little ones. So it would be better for you to have this millstone tied around your neck and thrown over into the sea. You would, call, it would, you would cause you to drown. You would not be able to get away. That would be an excruciating death to drown. I have never drowned. I've, I've had times where I've, I've fell in the water unexpectedly. It kind of scared me. You know, the, the, the closest thing I could think of is, is, is doing like extreme hard endurance workouts and it's when you stop and you can't catch your breath. You know, we call it working under fatigue when you're, when you're in CrossFit. You work under fatigue, you'll get on that salt bite, you go hard, and then you're supposed to go into your next movement. And you get more used to it, but at first it scares you because you cannot breathe. You cannot breathe or catch your breath for like 10, 5 or 10 seconds, but it gets easier to do. But that is very scary. It's very excruciating. So drowning would be a terrible death. That's why they use, I'm sure y'all have heard the term waterboarding. Whenever they waterboarded uh, prisoners of war and stuff during the uh, Iraq war and Afghanistan war, they, they ended up making it illegal, you know, to do that because it's so excruciating, it's so terrifying. But the reason they would waterboard them is, is it makes them feel like they are being drowned and that they um, basically scares them so bad they finally, like, want them to do whatever, hey, stop, and I'll give you whatever information you want. So this just shows you how terrifying this would be to, be, to, to drown. So Jesus is saying it would be better to go through an excruciating death of drowning than it would be to offend one of these little ones. So what is a little one? When you, when you hear like the word uh, little one, you think like a little kid, a little baby, you heard the old term, hey, little feller, you know, but 
that's kind of what we think of, but a little one would be a new believer. It's, it's somebody that's new in their Christian walk, somebody that's, that's just been saved. They can be, you know, they could be 10 years old, they could be 15 years old, they could be 70 years old, they could be 80 years old, 50 years old. Whenever they have first become saved, they are, they are, would, this is what we're talking about here, a little one. So you think of like a, a child or baby. They do not know what a whole lot about things. You have to teach them. They don't know that if they walk off that deal, they're going to fall off the cliff. They don't know if that uh, stove is hot if they touch it. You have to teach them these things. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't send an apprentice carpenter that's just starting to learn a month into a job of learning to be a carpenter. You wouldn't send them to build a skyscraper because they don't know they're, they're new at what they're doing. So Jesus is talking about the, the little ones. He says, it is better to go through this than to offend one of these little ones. It is better to go through an excruciating death than to mislead a new believer and cause them to sin. It's better to go through an excruciating death than to uh, lead them to temptation. Set them up for failure. It's better to go through excruciating death than it is to uh, make them question their faith. So it's very important. It's very, very important that we pay attention here. So Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Again, in Romans, he says, Receive one who is weak in faith, but do not dispute over doubtful things. Why does Paul warn against this? Most importantly, why does Jesus warn us against this? One day you will have to face him and God Almighty, Jesus, and you will have to answer for this. Jesus is our, our protector and he is looking out for the vulnerable, the weak, the ones that are, that are not ready, that are not stable. He's going to pay special attention to those. You get ones that are more mature, hey, you're a, little bit, you're a little bit better here to go. You get ones that are new, vulnerable people. That's, who, that's why Jesus is protecting them. He is our protector. If you're a mature believer in Jesus Christ, you must not be the cause of a younger believer's sin. It will be way worse than the young believer's sin that they did. A young believer is, like I said, anybody that is in the age 10, 35, 55, 90. It don't matter. You could be uh, 15 years old and you could be a um, believer. You could be, a, you have been saved. You've committed yourself to Jesus Christ. And you could be teaching a 55-year-old man that just now has committed himself to Jesus Christ. You have to make sure you handle that appropriately. Well, we help them to grow in their faith. When, when, we are, when we help them to grow in their faith, we are doing God's work. But when we lead them to temptation, we're doing the devil's work. Now, isn't it crazy how many times we're doing the devil's work and we don't even realize it? I mean, he, he is very slick. You always think of the devil. You think of the little guy with the horns, the pitchfork, the flames, you know, casting demons and flames and daggers. That's what we think of when we say think of the devil. But it's not. The, the, the devil is very deceiving. He, he's, it's beauty. It's slick. It's uh, slick talk. It's temptations. He's, gonna, he's not going to come at you. He's going to be disguised. He's going to be disguised in the things that tempt you, that look good to you. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I fear least somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's telling you right here that the devil is very deceiving. He will deceive you, so beware. You know, a lot of times when we are splitting hairs over something, trying to figure, fill in a gray area, 
trying to figure out, you know, is this right or is this wrong? We say gray area, you know, there's either black or right. Here's right, here's wrong, all this in the middle is gray area. And there's a lot of times I, I'm I bad myself. I, I'll have people come ask me, hey, is this, what does the Bible say about this? Or what is this? Is this right or is this wrong, you know? And they're trying to split hairs over something. In nine in three quarters time out of ten, whatever you're trying to decide on, whatever you're splitting hairs on, it's going to be wrong. You're going to be in the wrong. It's going to be a big, uh, what you're trying to justify is going to be wrong. If you're a mature believer in Christ, you need to set a good example. You have to be as much as your words and what how you uh teach somebody but you need to also teach with your examples so tell paul gives timothy instructions in um first timothy he says let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in war in word in conduct in love in spirit in faith in purity you will teach your kids as much by your actions as by your words. It is the same thing as with a new believer. They will be looking at you, seeing how you carry yourself, how do you act, how you handle yourself in certain situations, tough situations. Something might come up, and their first thing they're going to see is, let's see how this person acts. I want to see how I'm supposed to act in these kind of situations. So you have to be make sure you're carrying yourself in a a Christian manner. Um, but be ready to share God's word when they come at you with a question. You know, the best way to push somebody away is, you know, what the way, I guess, the terminology nowadays you might call is acting like a fool. You know, somebody that's throwing a tantrum, somebody that pouts all the time, somebody, woe is me. That's the best way to push somebody away because nobody wants to be around that. So imagine if you're supposed, to, if you're a new believer, and you're you got somebody you you're, you're trying to respect or you respect, and they've led you to the Christ, and all of a sudden you start acting like a fool. What kind of image does that give them? Well, that's, I guess if he's doing it, it's gonna be okay for me to do that. You know, you got to be careful with your actions. Your actions will speak a lot louder than your words. Remember. Um, you don't feed a baby steak. So with a new believer, you got to be careful what you show and teach them. You know, like I said, you don't feed a baby steak. When the baby's first born, it, it gets milk till, till it is able to digest solid food, till it's able, able to digest, you know, it might be mu uh, mashed up stuff, and then it gets to solid food, and then it can be meat, and then it can be this but they don't start out eating a T-bone steak. They start out with milk. And it's the same thing with new Christians when they are starting their walk. You don't, you don't throw them in the fire. You, don't, you wouldn't ask a new Christian to come up and start speaking. Oh, hey, man, what's your experience? I, I got saved last month. You wouldn't ask them to come up and start being a preacher. You wouldn't ask them to be a leader in the church. You wouldn't ask them to teach a Sunday school full of teenagers. You know, you don't, you don't ask them to do those things. And you don't start throwing too much at them at once, once they are a new believer. They have to start with milk before they can make it to a steak. So let's remember that. So now let's get, let's get back to our scripture we're studying here. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. So heed, take heed. You know, I'm like, heed, what is heed? The only thing I know that's called heed is this um, uh, supplement I take that's kind of like Gatorade, you add it to your water. I don't know why it's called heed, but it's like a, like a sports drink, you know, it rehydrates you. I don't think they're talking about drinking this, but... Take heed. Heed is to pay careful attention to. So pay, it says take heed, pay careful attention to. 
pay careful attention to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Now, how many people know what rebuke means? I'm sure there's quite a few. I'm sure that everybody's pulling out their phone. Maybe, I don't know. Rebuke means to express sharp disapproval of someone over their actions or behavior. So express sharp disapproval. Now, that don't mean like you start throwing daggers at them, uh, throwing knives at them. Not that kind of rebuke, but it's, hey, look, this is not right. You know, here, look, whoa, you got this wrong here. Let's just, let, we need to get this fixed real quick. So if something was a small offense, you know, one thing I can tell you being a, uh, being a boss's son is, you get it from all angles. Uh, you, the, your family, you work for your family. You, you're not doing enough, and you can't do it good enough. You'll never be able to do it good enough. The people you work under or you work with, they think you got it made. You're the golden child. You know, you're caught in the middle. So you, got, you learn to get a little tough, learn to let a lot of things just bounce off of you. So some things, sometimes people say something or do something offensive, you got to let it bounce off. Sometimes people do things that they don't even really mean anything by it. You know, and then there's sometimes people don't even realize they're offending you. It could be like when I, when I offended my old boss and I didn't know I was supposed to start at 7 and I was still sitting there for 30 minutes, you know. That's what I've done for the last two or three months. But, you know, some, there's, sometimes you'll know people that, you know, that, that just keep calling you the wrong name and they honestly call everybody the wrong name. I mean, why would you get offended? If they honestly are making a mistake, you don't need to be carrying that. You know, you can tell them, oh, sorry, wrong, um, I'm so-and-so. Hey, I'm Ben, not Brad, you know. I, I, a lot of times I've been called worse, you know. But, um, but if it's something small and it's a lot of things, there's a lot of things that people can overlook. Sometimes people say stuff in the... Um, before they can e you can even have a chance to respond to them, they've already apologized. Those things we're not really too worried about. But if somebody offends you and you just cannot let it go, it's got your attention and you cannot let it go, this is something you cannot let go and it keeps your attention, then you need to rebuke them. Then you need to tell them. You need to correct them. So Jesus himself tells us how to deal with a sinning brother how to handle somebody that has sinned against you, that has caused you um, a pr big problem. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. If you want to write that verse down, it's Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. Moreover, moreover if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, if he understands, if he apologizes, you have gained your brother. But if he not, will not hear you, take with you one or two more that may, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So if somebody offends you or wrongs you, tell them. Let them know what they did. Hey, man, look, here, here, you offended me. You know, I had, I had one time I had somebody borrow a pretty large sum of money from me. It wasn't too long ago. You know, when, when things are good, that's fine, you know what I mean? But it was at a point in time where I could, um, it wasn't going to kill me. And I know it says in the Bible, you don't loan money unless you can do without it. But, and I really thought I was helping this person out. When two or three months, months later, this person hadn't even made the first attempt at paying me back. And then they had the gall to ask me, hey, do you know a good uh, uh, fence contractor? I'm sitting there thinking, you're going to build a fence and you owe me money and everybody else money. You know what I'm saying? That, and it offended me. Now, if they hear you have gained a, if they hear you, 
you had gained a brother. How many times have you had a major confrontation with someone and end up being good friends of them? I'll fall back to, uh, to two people I was talking about earlier. You know, those two guys had known each other. Uh, when, when they first knew each other, it was, you know, they, they, they hated each other. And then they finally locked horns. We call it locked horns. They finally had it out. And they ended up being like best friends. I think sometimes when you can be such good friends of people, you're going to have, you're going to have scrimmages. You're going to have times where you have disagreements. But those guys had confronted each other, and then they made up, and now they're good friends. So if they are not hearing you, then have, I'm sorry, if they are not hearing you, then have some mutual friends help explain what they did wrong. So right here it says, if you, if you have gained, uh, but if he will not hear you, take with, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, have we ever heard this? And I'm sure everybody here, everybody listening has ever said this. They take somebody, or they're telling somebody, will you go talk some sense into that boy? Will you go talk some sense into her? I, I, I've done all I can do. I need you to go talk some sense into them. It's the same thing. We're asking somebody to come help us talk some sense into somebody. That's kind of what he's talking about here. So then he says, if that doesn't work, if that doesn't work, tell the church. So that might, doesn't necessarily mean you have to drag them to the church building and say, hey, hey, here, right here, I'm in front of everybody. But maybe you tell somebody, a, a leader of the church. Uh, maybe you can tell the pastor. Maybe you can tell somebody that's a mature believer what's going on. And then maybe they can talk to them. Maybe they can um, help dissect the problem and fix it. Now, um, a lot of times you can go to somebody in the church and a lot of times why that problem will get fixed is when you're a true believer, you, you know that the only thing you should fear is, is God himself. You shouldn't fear an uncomfortable situation. And you shouldn't fear telling the truth to somebody. So sometimes when you confront somebody, you have to do that. You have to tell them the truth. You have to, um, you have to confront them without fear. Sometimes those things are not the easiest thing to do. And a lot of times if you, if you realize that you should handle this without no fear, it is a difference between night and day. Now, if none of this works, then you must know that this person is not a true believer. I say true believer, I'm talking about a true believer in Jesus Christ. But you have to give them an honest chance. I mean, you can't just like, hey, boom, I'm done with them. No, you got to give them an honest chance. You got to confront them honestly. If that doesn't work, then get some other people to kind of help talk some sense into it. Maybe there's somebody they respect more than you. Don't take offense to that. Go that route. If that doesn't work, then let's, you know, then take it to the church. Now, if it's somebody you work with, you're not going to drag them up here to church. I think this is more about church matters if you're going to take somebody to church or take it to church to get it resolved. But you have to give them an honest chance. And don't disown them. If, I mean, don't, you got to remember this person could be a future uh, follower of Christ. You don't want to disown them and cast them out you know, but you have to give them an honest chance. You have to do all this with honest intentions, not trying to set them up for failure. If it's somebody you don't like, you don't want to set them up to make them look bad and then have people confront them. That's, that's worse than what they did to you. A lot of times we don't want to rebuke somebody because we are scared or we don't want to offend them. And we let it turn into resentment and bitterness. I had this happen to me um, last year, matter of fact. And uh, I mean, it, it, it was 
you know, I was letting the, I was letting the bitterness and resentment control me and try to push, it actually even tried to push me away from the church. And as a matter of fact, it was a person that owed me all this money, but it was other things that they kept doing. I'm supposed to be the, the believer. I'm supposed to be looking up to this person. And they kept, I just kept seeing things that this was not right and how they would treat people or how they would treat me. And it was starting to cause a lot of bitterness and resentment. And I wouldn't directly um, hit it head on. And I was trying to sweep it under the rug and it wasn't going away. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. The resentment was building up. So I was letting the resentment and bitterness control me to the point of it was affecting my whole thoughts. I mean, it was affecting, I would walk in the church building and it was, it was affecting where I was about ready to leave the church. Just because I wouldn't, I was too scared to hand, handle this problem, hit it head on. I was trying to sweep it under the rug. But finally, by God's grace, he brought it to my attention that you need to handle, you need to get, you need to handle this problem. You know, he gave me one of these bam, bam, upside the face. He got my attention. But during this time, for a period of time of about three to six months, I was being a coward because I would not handle the problem. I would not confront the person with this problem. And I was letting the bitterness and resentment build up in me. And it starts building you, then it starts controlling you. And we do not want that. People have to be careful, especially mature believers. They can start off with good intentions, but can be deceived by the world. And when you're deceived, deceived by the world, you're being deceived by Satan. And their actions can mislead people and even push them away from the Lord. Jesus said it is better to drown than, than to mislead a new believer. Remember, your actions are just as important as your words, maybe more important. If the person is a believer, they will repent. If the person is a true believer, you can feel confident that you can confront them. They might be a little upset at first, but they will repent. If they are a true believer, they will repent. They will apologize and everything will be fine. If they are not a true believer, they probably will not repent. But if they honestly repent, then forgive them. This is the forgiveness that brings out the new relationship, like we talked about earlier. So I know we've all heard of Mike Tyson and in, in, um, Evander Holyfield. I believe that's the two right ones. I believe that's the guy that Mike Tyson bit off his ear. Is that correct, Andrew? Okay. I just blew my cover here, but that's all right. So Mike Tyson, this was like in the, in the 90s, I believe, and they were in a fight, and he was starting to lose, and, and Mike Tyson bit off Evander of Holyfield's ear. I mean, he bit off a chunk of it. It was bitter, bitter enemies, the whole nine yards. These two guys are like best buddies now. They've made shows together, movies together. They do podcasts, but they're good friends. You know, they have forgiven each other. They have moved on. They have, made, they, they, they have true forgiveness where they have built a great relationship. If we refuse to hold people accountable of their sins, then we are a selfish coward is what we're being. That's what I was being last year with, with the problem I was trying to deal with. I was being a selfish coward. I was letting it affect me, and I would not confront the person for a period of time. Finally, I did. If we try to, to if we try and forgive by sweeping it under the rug, hoping it'll go away, it, it will eventually come out. Eventually, that resentment, that that bitterness, turns into anger and hatred, and eventually, it's going to come out. It might be a month later, it might be a week later, it might be ten years later, it might be twenty years later, but it will eventually come out. You confront them, and they will either repent, and your bond will get better. Are you, and you gain a brother, or they will run off like you same boat. If they are a true believer in Jesus Christ, they will repent. Now let's move on to verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. 
So seven is the number of completion. It took seven days for God to, uh, to build the world. It took them seven days. So if this is the number of completion, you have to keep on forgiving. The day you stop forgiving people is the day you fall out of the goodwill of God. So even, even hanging on the cross, Jesus' words were, this is in the book of Luke, then Jesus said, he's hanging up on the cross, he's been through everything he's been through, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then it was over with. This is for the ones that did not know any better. This is the people that did not know any better. They did not know what they were doing. But we know better. We are true Christians, know better. We might have to be reminded, but we know better. Paul tells us in Ephesians, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Just as God forgave us through Jesus Christ, we must be able to forgive. If you're not, if you're not able to forgive someone, then pray. You have to be able to forgive to be forgiven. If, if you're tired of carrying around bitterness and resentment towards someone, then pray to God about it. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. If you come to the altar and you start praying, and you still got a problem with somebody, somebody's got a problem with you, you need to deal with it. You need to make it right. If you ha need to forgive somebody, you got to let it go. You got to be able to forgive somebody. How can you expect Jesus Christ to forgive you for you to be forgiven of your sins if you cannot forgive somebody else? You don't have to forget what they did, but you have to forgive them. Don't think you cannot be forgiven because we all can be forgiven. Don't think you're too far gone. If we repent and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and believe that he rose from the dead, then we can be healed and saved. Don't go another day wondering why you cannot forgive this person. Don't let it control you and eat you up. Don't, let, don't be somebody that carries something around for years, for years. I mean like 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Don't carry that resentment and hate around. It will eat at you. Don't be that person that when you see Jesus, he says, Go, I do not know you, for you never accepted me. Don't let it control you and eat you up. Don't pass it down to the next generation. You have to be able to forgive somebody. Don't fool yourself. If you feel that hugging, or I'm, I'm sorry, that tugging on your heart, let them in. That's Jesus knocking on the door. That's the Holy Spirit knocking. Let them in. Take that leap of faith. Jesus is calling to you. He loves you and wants you. The door is open. You just have to walk in and accept him. We have to be able to forgive somebody. We don't want to be the cause of somebody's sin. We don't want to lead them into temptation. We don't want to cause them to be weak. We want to, if we're a mature believer, we need to be a great example. Now, we have to be able to forgive to be forgiven. None of this will work truly unless you're a follower of Jesus Christ, unless you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, none of this will work truly. You can put Band-Aids over problems. You can put, uh, try and sweep it under the rug, but eventually it's going to come out. You have to forgive to be forgiven. Now, my greatest prayer, this would probably be the time when we would, we would have an altar call. Um, 
course, we, we can't do that right now. We're not a normal service, but my greatest prayer for anybody is that they know that, that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they have truly submitted to him, have let him in, have accepted him as the Lord and Savior, that they have, um, that they believe that he has rose from the dead. And don't feel that you cannot be forgiven. Don't feel that there's no hope, that you have to have a life of despair. But he does love you and he wants you. So I'd like to say a quick prayer before we go. And, and it's, it's called the sinner's prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer asking for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross that I might be forgiven and have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. Father, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and will worship you all the days of my life. Because your word is truth, I confess with my, my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being the Lord and Savior that you are. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you all for watching. Um, I've, I've learned something from this, and I originally was studying this message. I thought it was going to be something else, and, and it, it's something I've had to deal with myself, to be honest with you. And, and it's something I know other people have to deal with. So I, I just thank the Lord for giving us these messages to learn from and our reminders we need and giving us the book with the answers. Uh, keep up the good fight. I can't wait till the day when we all get to uh, meet together again in our church. And I um, love you guys. And like I said, keep up the good fight. Bye.